there's no reason to assume that epilepsy, as it is known today, spared prehistoric man. These were the words of Osai Timken in his book, The Falling Sickness. However, the concept that epilepsy is a condition that's derived from the aberrant electrical conduction in the brain is only one that gained popularity in the 20th century. We covered this in greater detail on Brainwaves back in November 2017 on the episode Brain Surgery for Epilepsy, when people like Soma Weiss, Bailey, and Brimmer proposed the radical notion that physical compression of the carotid arteries using something like a truss, or even electrical stimulation of the neck, could be used to treat seizures. In fact, the concept of electricity was still a relatively recent one, really seeing its first descriptions by entrepreneurs like Ben Franklin in the late 18th century. So how could it be that humans thousands and thousands of years before this had any idea about the mechanism that underlies the falling sickness? Welcome back to Brainwaves, a podcast about neurology and medicine and all the fascinating science and history that come with it. I'm Jim Siegler, your host, and this week on the program, we're going back in time to ancient Greece, to the time of Hippocrates of Kos, our father of medicine, to an era when epilepsy, the falling sickness, was considered to be more magic than medicine. What were the leading theories behind this peculiar affliction? How were people treated? And what kinds of social stigma did this create for patients? Stay with us. Hi, Brainwaves listeners. My name is Ray Price. I'm the director of the Neurology Residency Program at the University of Pennsylvania, and I also direct the Penn Neurology Board Review course, now in its 16th year. For those of you preparing for the initial or recertification examinations, you know this can be a stressful time, but it doesn't have to be. Our high-yield course is more than 50 hours of recorded lectures for you to review for up to six months before the boards, and two days of live or online case-based learning. Past participants have found this an excellent way to prepare with well-organized, high-yield material and engaging lectures. And for those of you who prefer problem-based learning, we have over a thousand board-style questions available to people who take the course. For Brainwaves listeners, we offer a $150 discount on registration fees if you enter the promo code WAVES2019. Just check out the website link in this week's show notes or Google 16th Pen Neurology Board Review. Again, the promo code is WAVES2019. That's WAVES in all caps, 2019. I'll start off the program by reminding you that seizures are common. Nearly 1% of the world's population today suffers from epilepsy. And there's no reason not to think that epilepsy had a similar epidemiology 3,000 years ago. When scholars refer back to ancient Mesopotamian and Egyptian texts, there's ample description of what can only be interpreted as seizures. The Code of Hammurabi, an ancient Babylonian legal text, 17th century BCE, mentioned that should a slave be traded between merchants, and they would be afflicted by Binu within the first month, which we presume to have been epilepsy, then such a slave could be returned to his or her previous owner for full compensation. Plato extended this one-month recommendation even further, writing that a non-physician merchant could return a slave for full reimbursement within 12 months of purchase. As a matter of fact, epilepsy was common enough that there were popular methods to even test slaves for this condition. In Greece, they often did this by having the slave smell some particular stone to see if it would draw out the falling sickness. If a slave did not faint or convulse upon smelling the stone, they'd be free of the disease. In addition to these legal texts, there were also a number of medical documents that carefully describe events in which a person would lose consciousness, flail about madly, bite their tongue, sometimes even sever it, and so forth. An Akkadian text from about 2000 BCE documents this about one patient. His head turns left, his hands and feet are tense and his eyes wide open, and from his mouth froth is flowing without having any convulsions. The Edwin Smith Papyrus, probably the oldest truly medical text from about 1700 BCE, also includes half a dozen unique cases of what were most likely epileptic convulsions, and to this day it remains perhaps the most single common neurologic disorder. But how did people in ancient times think about this condition? What were the theories behind these uncontrollable attacks? 
Before epilepsy was recognized as a disorder of the central nervous system, as we'll get into in a minute, the leading theories were that it was some sort of an evil curse or a demonic possession. In ancient Babylon, the various clinical manifestations of what was categorized as seizures were related to the various spirits or gods and usually indicated something malicious. In Mesopotamia, seizures were attributed to Antasubu, the hand of sin, who was their moon god. In Christian theology, even throughout the first century CE, convulsions were also thought to be supernatural in origin. The Gospel of Mark reads, A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought to you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. This is a pretty characteristic description of a tonic-clonic seizure. And yet Jesus is able to draw out the evil spirit from the young boy and cure him of epilepsy. Consequently, most physicians were more often religious leaders than what we would consider today to be more naturalistic or scientific physicians. It was probably the Hippocratic book, On the Sacred Disease, 400 BCE, that became the first public attempt to dispel any notion that magic influenced these epileptic attacks. Before this time, epilepsy was little more than erratic behaviors conjured by magicians or wizards, or the physical manifestation of the hand of God upon mankind. To many, it was called the sacred disease, divine in mechanism, cast down upon man from God or from many gods, or the influence of evil spirits. Hippocrates, our father of medicine, denounced these notions, criticizing the faith healers and the witch doctors who had promoted such false beliefs. The gods were not at fault for the defamation of the body or spirit, and nor were these attacks the result of any person's wrongdoing or impious act. Like other medical conditions that afflicted the human body, Hippocrates wrote, epilepsy was not divine. It was worldly, secular, probably heritable, resulting from an imbalance in the humors and triggered by environmental cues rather than the will of a divine power. The disease called the sacred, Hippocrates writes, arises from causes as the others, namely those things which enter and quit the body, such as cold, the sun, and the winds, which are ever-changing and are never at rest. And these things are divine, so that there is no necessity for making a distinction and holding this disease to be more divine than the others, but all are divine. To Hippocrates, seizures were the consequence of excess phlegm, which would rush into the blood vessels, throwing off the balance of blood in the body and causing the body to convulse. It was a physical rather than a magical disease. Hippocrates was also quite ahead of his time, supposing that epilepsy and the excess phlegm that caused it was a process that originated in the central nervous system, the brain. Only about 200 years earlier, an Indian physician named Atreya also maintained a similar belief that the brain was responsible for seizures. But whether Hippocrates was aware of this eastern hypothesis is unclear. How seizures occurred, according to Hippocratic teaching, was that white phlegm would be released by the brain and into what's now known as the circulatory system, admixing with the black bile and disturbing the normal fluid balance of the body. The ancient philosopher Plato, a contemporary of Hippocrates, had just begun to promote the idea that the brain was the seat of consciousness and it was the organ responsible for all behaviors. In that same camp stood Hippocrates. In the words of the physician, men ought to know from nothing else but thence from the brain come joys, delights, laughter, and sports, and sorrows, griefs, despondency, and lamentations. And by this, in an especial manner, we acquire wisdom and knowledge, and see and hear and know what are foul and what are fair, what are bad and what are good, what are sweet and what are unsavory. And by the same organ we become mad and delirious, and fears and terrors assail us. All these things we endure from the brain. So the concept that the brain determined bodily functions and actions was taking off in ancient Greece. And it was certainly adopted by Galen, who advanced the Hippocratic practices and promoted the definition of epilepsy as one of the convulsive disorders, like tremor, with the critical addendum of, quote, interruption of the leading functions, meaning loss of awareness or consciousness, 
it would be an understatement to say that such proclamations were transformative in medical care. By shifting the blame from one that was more mythical or religious to one that was natural and organic, patient care would be delivered by those who understood techni, or science, by physicians, and not by the greedy quacks who peddled their tricks to the ill-informed. Additionally, the natural explanation for the previously sacred disease stimulated a general shift in the medical knowledge and the healthcare at the time. Medical inquiry and discovery underwent a major surge, as physicians like Hippocrates and Galen sought to better understand the physiology rather than the magic of health. Observation, documentation, and early efforts of a scientific method were beginning to emancipate medicine from superstition. There were, of course, other theories as to the mechanism that caused the falling sickness. Today, we also recognize there to be several causes. Febrile illnesses, genetic mutations in sodium channels, traumatic injury, stroke. So yeah, I can buy that the Greeks conceived multiple possible pathways through which the sacred disease may have come about. Galen even supposed that some seizures may have originated in the stomach, as they could be triggered by the ingestion of certain substances. Or they may have been associated with the classic rising sensation in the stomach that we hear reported in our patients today. But it was Hippocrates who thought that the lung functions were intimately related. And here's where the proposed mechanisms become circular and kind of difficult to follow. In his text, On the Sacred Disease, Hippocrates claims that when excess white phlegm from the nervous system mixes with the black bile in the circulation, it may precipitate a respiratory arrest. It seems to have been the cold phlegm that interfered with the healthy circulation of the black bile, obstructing its normal flow, and ultimately interfering with one's ability to breathe. And this was something that you would be born with, a hereditary tendency, not something that was conceived out of magic or cast upon you for your transgressions. Then, only later, in Hippocrates' subsequent text, On Breaths, now it becomes the abnormal breathing or the stagnation of breath that leads to epileptic convulsions. As probably the most vital organ in the body, according to Hippocratic teaching, the brain was the first site to which air would be circulated. After air reaches the brain, and it permits consciousness and the other mental faculties, air can then be distributed to the remaining organs. Therefore, should one suffer from loss of air to the mind, epilepsy would soon follow. The notion that lack of air resulted in seizures or at least some sort of ictal phenomena, was supported by early attempts at scientific inquiry, observations that suffocation would result in a similar loss of consciousness, sometimes even convulsions, or incontinence of stool or urine, which was seen in other examples of the falling sickness. It was kind of a clever conclusion, actually, that lack of air could precipitate a seizure, one that we might agree with today when we come across seizures in the setting of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. The disease was also supposed to have been hereditary, as I said earlier, as were all diseases of mankind, probably originating from the semen of men, and perhaps even related to the act of sexual intercourse itself. Coitus is a slight epileptic attack, Hippocrates wrote. Other precipitants, like temperature fluctuations, changes in the season, directions of the wind, exercise, excess consumption of wine and certain foods, these were all related to this condition but with much less traditional evidence to support it. There was no real scientific method back in 400 BCE, no evidence-based medical practice, so most of the associations were anecdotal. However, some of these observations were about as evidence-based as we could have gotten in a time that predated the scientific method. Traumatic head injury, for example, was a known trigger for convulsions, and Hippocratic surgeons of the time would consider trepanning the skull in these instances in order to restore balance of the humors and to alleviate the seizures. Nowadays, we think to do this to relieve intracranial pressure as it builds up. If you haven't already, then you might want to take a listen to the episode we put together in the past on the history of trepanation. Japan was performed on a point where there was no fracture or probably even no wound, so the surgical act was preceded by a diagnosis. We are authorized to conclude that there was in Peru, before the European epoch, an advanced surgery. It's a pretty unbelievable technique for a type of surgery that we've been practicing for millennia. So we've talked about what consisted of epilepsy and what the ancient Greeks thought may have caused it. But what of the auras and other associated symptoms we know today? Well, aura derives from the Greek word for breeze, 
and this was not the description of a physician, but of a patient. A 13-year-old boy who had suffered from epilepsy had described to Galen a sensation that rose up his leg, behind the buttock, and up to the head, after which it would resolve. And he compared this to a breeze. There were also other premonitory symptoms that would be ascribed to epilepsy, abnormal perceptions that may have preceded an epileptic attack, heaviness, giddiness in the head, vertigo, visual hallucinations, difficulty with speech, tinnitus, or listlessness. And some of these subjective symptoms, as you know, are well validated in our current literature. Following the aura, the clinical manifestations of epilepsy were pretty clearly documented, even in Hippocrates' time. Convulsive and non-convulsive events with loss of consciousness were equally characterized. Foam flows from his mouth, Hippocrates wrote. He suffocates and may pass excrements. This is followed by a period of what appeared to have been sleep, and subsequently amnesia. Other kinds of known but uncommon epileptic phenomena, like the ictal cry, the postictal paresis or paralysis, tongue biting, and in some cases the total amputation of the tongue, these were also well documented. Particular attention was paid to the pulses in ancient Greek literature. Again, one of the prevailing notions of the time was that excess phlegm would enter the circulation, it would mix with the black bile in the blood and lead to a seizure, in somewhat of a dose response. A normal amount of blood would provide a robust pulsation of the arteries and permit normal consciousness. However, when there would be a moderate seizure, the tension of the artery would fall, and in cases of severe seizures, the pulse would be weak and rapid. All this being said, how did such notions and other observational evidence inform treatments in ancient Greece? Having no true scientific method for another two millennia, how did physicians of antiquity manage patients with the sacred disease? This brings us back to the underlying cause. At the time of Hippocrates and Plato, by the 5th and the 4th centuries BCE, epilepsy was emerging as a natural condition, something we might call physiologic or pathophysiologic because, quote, epilepsy was no more divine than other diseases, according to our father of medicine. It would not benefit from prayer or incantations, but by diet and drugs, physical remedies that would aim to even out the humors. It was common, in fact, for physicians of antiquity to recommend balanced diets for epilepsy, physical activity, cleanliness, and regularity of bodily excretions. When epileptic attacks were observed among pregnant women, what we would call eclampsia nowadays, the importance of a safe delivery could not be overstated. These hysterical attacks, as they were called, referred to attacks which originate in the womb. And unfortunately, the etymology of words like hysteria and hysterical date back to the Greek word meaning of the womb. As far as other causes were concerned, if sexual intercourse was itself a mild epileptic event, then abstinence or even castration could be preventative. And in some cases, this was recommended by Greek physicians. Ultimately, as you'd imagine, most treatments were ineffective, and many patients either expired from complications of epilepsy, or they went on about their lives, punctuated by these sudden attacks. But what did this mean for them? What did these patients make of the condition they suffered from? Many in ancient times were segregated, or even banished from their communities. Epilepsy remained a consequence of sinful activity, or a curse from an evil spirit. It was the physical stigmata of an immoral person in religious societies. So, naturally, these people were labeled as such, shunned from conventional activities and communities. And not only was this sort of excommunication socially isolating, but it was also further disabling in the pre-Hippocratic era. Sometimes, patients would have been denied prayers or incantations to alleviate the symptoms of their illness just to keep them away from the church. In early Judeo-Christian theology, epileptics would be barred from sharing the same table for communion, and they'd be denied from drinking out of the same cup as others, so as not to desecrate these holy objects by their own impurity. As somebody who was raised a Christian, I'm disappointed to learn of this discrimination, but I'm not surprised by it. If a religious treatment had been available, either in the form of prayer or some method of spiritual support, why not focus more attention on these people? Aren't the tenets of Christian theology based on selflessness and generosity towards others? In the kingdom of heaven, the first will be last, and the last will be first. Isn't that what they say?
As we're discussing this, the way we regard epileptic patients nowadays, compared to how we've historically regarded people who suffer from this falling sickness, the same prejudices abound. In spite of all our efforts to educate people, and all the wealth of knowledge that research and science and medical technology have afforded to us, patients with epilepsy continue to suffer from similar injustices, and they continue to feel discriminated against. It remains a terribly stigmatizing disease, as you heard from Tori Robinson's amazing story back in episode 65, Active Recovery. But there's no miasma, no bad air, no evil spirits, and no punishments by a higher power. Epilepsy is not contagious. These people are sick, sure, yeah, they're sick. But nobody's perfect. So why should we be the ones who make this condition even more miserable for them? Epilepsy, the sacred disease. For more information on related topics, we've covered the ancient history of trepanation for neurologic disease in a prior show, episode number 78, Evil Spirits in Your Head, and of course the show I just mentioned, The Touching Story of One Woman's Survival with Epilepsy, episode number 65, and as always, you can find related content in each program's show notes. The Brainwaves Podcast is produced at a Studio 3 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Jim Siegler, Senior Producer. Music courtesy of Alavedra Montserrat, Joseph Levine, and William McConnell, Damiano Baldoni, Kai Engel, Kevin McLeod, Raphael Archangel, and Unheard Music Concepts. Sound effects by Mike Koenig and Daniel Simeon. For more information, please follow us on Twitter or Facebook at Brainwaves Audio, and we'd love to hear from you if you have any thoughts about today's show or anything that we've put together in the past. We're always trying to improve what we're doing here for the program. I'm Jim Siegler. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.